Calvary, this is Pastor Chad, and given the events of our world uh, recently, uh, we've seen the, the tragic uh, death of uh, George Floyd, we've seen the, the legitimate protests of uh, the, the racial injustice that have come out of that, uh, we've seen the, the hijacking of those protests by looters and people who are bent on the destruction uh, of businesses, uh, of stealing, and, and of society in general. And, and it begs the, the question that we need to deal with, and that is the, the question about racism, about justice, and, and about our lives. And I wanted to have that, that discussion with some friends of mine who are pastors uh, and who have had different life experiences than I have had. So uh, I've invited uh, Ruben Magdaleno, who is uh, the campus pastor of our Parker campus, uh, and, and Ruben has been with us for a couple of years, uh, serving in a great way. Uh, and then uh, Ezekiel Kesatilwe, who is a volunteer pastor over at Covenant Church here in our community. And he's also a business owner. Uh, he owns uh, Sunrise Pharmacy and is a doctor of pharmacology. And, and so uh, I've asked them if they would share a little bit out of their experiences uh, about the the treatment they've received that has been racism and how that has impacted their lives. Uh, so Ruben, uh, how have, have you been impacted by racism and, and uh, what are some of the experiences that you've had with that? Yeah, you know, all my life, um, obviously been dealing with racism, um, even culturally, you know, when I was younger, being Mexican uh, American or Chicano, you're never too Mexican enough or you're never too American enough. So it was always there. And um, I was already battling identity issues as a child. Um, so I had a lot of that going on. And as I got older, you know, the jobs that I had, people would forget my name, call me Jose or whatever Mexican name that they thought it was. Um, you get the sneers, you get the looks. Um, and you kind of deal with that. And, and it starts to build a callus, you know. Um, you start to feel belittled. You start to feel um, just like you don't belong. And, and, and. I lived my life that way, and so a lot of what I did was driven by the anger and by the hurt and the frustration that was in me. Hey, thank you for, uh, for sharing that. Now, Ezekiel, you are a man uh, uh, that has had really different experiences because uh, you're born in Botswana, uh, right on the border of South Africa uh, under apartheid. Uh, you moved to the United States. You've studied here. Uh, you become a, a citizen here. Uh, what are some of the experiences you've had uh, dealing with racism? Yes, uh, growing in Botswana, uh, Botswana was a uh, very peaceful country. We didn't have any racism, uh, you know. Uh, so um, uh, we just had a lot about ap apathy, which kind of touched us a little bit, you know, because we saw what it did to uh, some of our, our fellow uh, Africans. So, but moving here to the United States, um, it was different. It was different because uh, racism in America is, is twofold. It, it can, you, you have the subtle one that's institution, institu institutionalized, and then you have the physical one where people just tell you, we don't like you because you're black, uh, or whatever. you. So um, the inst institutionalized one, the subtle one is the one that really hurts because um, that one is, uh, you, you feel like you are being accepted, you feel like you are, you are being welcomed, but you're really not because, for example, um, in my English class, you know, um, uh, the teacher would always, uh, in my English papers, always give me a, a letter C grade with no markings of corrections, but, and then I pick over my uh, white counterpart and I see all red markings of corrections and all that, and I see an A plus. So those things, are, that kind of racism is the one that really hurts, because uh, I'd rather you tell me to my face that you don't like me or whatever because I'm black, but, uh, but if you accept me, and, and you have these undertones that you re I'm not really uh, uh, welcome, it, 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 that's the kind of racism that really hurts. Mm -hmm. And that, that's the one that really stinks. Uh, mm -hmm. Did anyone actually ever just like come out front uh, and just confront you with uh, overt racism? Oh yes, uh, I was, went to school in uh, Russellville, Arkansas when I came, first came to the US. So I just, and here's the other thing, you know, when you come from a country like Botswana, Africa, you don't know what's really going on between blacks and white in America. So I just, I was free to go wherever I wanted. So I come to America and there are places that I'm not supposed to walk in. So I walk into this convenience store and this guy just says, uh, older guy says, you know what? I, I don't like your black people, but you seem like you're a good boy. So I'm gonna go ahead and help you anyway. You know, but that, I was okay with that 
because I knew where I stand and I knew where not, where not to go next time. So. Oh, wow. I, I, I just grieve in uh, hearing your guys' uh, uh, stories of pain and experiences. Uh, so you're both men of God. You're both serving Christ. You're both actively engaged in the kingdom work. So obviously God has redeemed uh, through the, the, the sin of racism in your lives. What are, what are some of the things that God has done in your life to help you to overcome uh, the subtle and overt racism that you've encountered uh, that, that attacked your identity, that uh, uh, surprised you, disappointed you, frustrated you? How, how did God do that in your life? You know, uh, living, uh, when, I, when I was back in, in Botswana, I, I grew up in a Christian home, so I've always uh, 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 valued the, the standards of Christianity. So when I came to the U.S., uh, really before I came out, I had a very good encounter with God where I just had to know who God is in my life. So uh, when I came out here, uh, the main thing that really kept me going was my faith in Christ because sometimes when people even don't think that you belong, but you understand, and God, you understand your position in, in Christ, and, and he accepts me, and, and he uh, conforms me, and, and, and tells me that I'm his own. That's the only thing that matters, you know, because uh, what people say and what, how, how people say it, uh, it, can make you, can, it can make you turn and do something or, uh, or react in anger or react, react in a certain way. But if you understand who you are. Really, what people say out there doesn't really matter because it's Christ in us, the hope of glory that keeps us going. Because I know I belong in the kingdom. I may not belong in your circle of friends, but I understood that I belonged in God's kingdom, and that's what mattered for me. So that's what kept me going, that Christ and my faith in Christ kept me going at all times. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm glad that you didn't give up. And I'm glad that, uh, that you're here in our community uh, and representing Christ in a godly way uh, in business and in ministry. Uh, Reuben, uh, tell us a little bit about how God has redeemed in your life, because your path was very different than Ezekiel's, but God's brought you guys to the same place of, of serving. Yeah, he did. Um, when I gave my life to Christ in 2008, um, I talked about struggling with identity earlier. He put that identity in me. He put that sense of belonging, um, that he cared for me, value, everything was instilled in me. Um, about 10 months after I got saved, I turned myself in for crimes that I had committed. So now I was going to the most racist place you can think of, and that was the prison system. Now it's one thing, um, as soon as you get in there, you're segregated with your race. Whether you're black, white, or other, it didn't matter. You had to, you had to do that. The one thing that they agreed on was that they didn't like Christians. Mm -hmm. And so going in there as a Christian was really, really just really had to say, okay, Lord, I'm going to trust you in this. And so I remember my first Bible study. I couldn't sit, you know, on another race's bunk bed. Um, so I had to think strategy. And so I started pray praying to God and just asking him, give me wisdom and strategy. Um, I asked a couple of guys, hey, do you want to do a Bible study? A couple of black guys, a couple of Asian guys, white guys, Mexican guys. And I had my first Bible study. And that's when I really knew that. You know, it was only the Spirit of God that transcended um, race or ethnicity or division, all of that. And so, yeah, that was, that was awesome. You know, um, uh, it, it, your story uh, is just amazing because it makes me think of uh, the Apostle Paul's words to the church at, Gal at Galatia where uh, Paul said, In Christ there is no Jew or Greek. There is no male nor female. There is no slave or free. We're all one in Christ Jesus because uh, he brings us together. And, and then uh, the Apostle John in his scene, when he looks in and sees heaven worshiping, and they said, uh, Jesus is worthy. The Lamb is worthy because he's purchased men for God with his blood from every tribe and language and people and nation. And, uh, you know, racism is real. Uh, whether it's touched you or not, it's real. And it's something that we, we ought to grieve because it grieves the heart of God Amen. because Jesus broke the walls down that separates us and brings us together. And, uh, and these are gentlemen who have lived it and who are living it right now, demonstrating uh, their faithfulness to God, demonstrating their, their faith they're going to continue and overcoming uh, the racism they've experienced in life. And so, uh, guys, I, I thank you for being with us. I thank you for sharing your heart. And I thank you for being servants of the living God. Amen. You know, it's been uh, kind of an insane week or two. Uh, as we as a nation have uh, 
grieved, been shocked by the injustice of uh, George Floyd's death. Uh, the video is hard to watch, uh, painful. Uh, not only that, there's been the injustice of David Dorn, uh, a uh, retired police captain in St. Louis that was shot and killed. Uh, the injustice of David Underwood, a, a homeland security officer killed in Oakland. Uh, closer to home, the injustice of Shea uh, Michelonis in Las Vegas. Is he still fighting for his life? There's been the injustice uh, that is addressed uh, through uh, protests, legitimately. We had one in Havasu today. Uh, as well as the injustice of riots and looting. And our, our nation has been divided. It's been broken. It's been uh, seemingly at war with each other. And so this weekend, I want to address that uh, by looking at Luke chapter 11. I invite you, to, if you're here in the building, take your Bibles, uh, turn to Luke chapter 11. It's page 1033. If you're uh, part of our online campus, uh, grab your Bible, your Bible app, and join us uh, in finding Luke chapter 11. I, I do have to just tell everybody that uh, here at Calvary, we plan our sermons way in advance. And this text was actually chosen over six months ago. Uh, we already had planned that, so God kind of met us here in this, uh, and you're going to see why when we read this text, but, uh, but this was uh, not something we just decided on this week to preach on. Uh, like I said, months ago, uh, God had led us to this text, this passage, this impossible series, and, and this is what Jesus has to say to us in the midst of this uh, insanity in our nation right now. Uh, I'm going to pick up verse 14. It says, now Jesus was casting out a demon that was mute. And when the demon had gone out, the mute man spoke and the people marveled. But some of them said, he cast out demons by Beelzebul, the prince of demons, while others to test him kept seeking from him a sign from heaven. But Jesus, knowing their thoughts, said to them, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. And if Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebul, but if I cast out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out demons, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man, fully armed, guards his own palace, his goods are safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, he takes away his armor in which he trusted and divides his spoil. Whoever is not with me is against me. And whoever does not gather with me scatters. Uh, a house divided is going to fall. Uh, now, I want to walk through this passage. I want to talk about some things, but realize that this, again, was a, a text picked months ago, actually wrote this sermon before all of the craziness started happening. I mean, it was crazy. It was just coronavirus crazy. So uh, the first thing I want you to see in this text is the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus. Jesus cast out another demon. And now, if you read the Gospels, he does that all the time. I mean, Jesus is always casting demons out of people, uh, and that's significant because Jesus has the power over evil spirits. I mean, uh, uh, we talked about the reality of demonic forces several weeks ago, and if you missed that, it's the May 23rd, 24th weekend. Uh, just go back and listen to that. I'm not going to spend a lot of time breaking that down again. But there is a spiritual battle that is taking place in our world and in your life. That's a reality. There is a spiritual battle. And, and here's what Jesus said about that. In John chapter 10, he said, the thief, talking about Satan, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. Only to steal and kill and destroy. But I have come that you might have life and have it abundantly. Have it overflowing. So Jesus made it clear. Uh, he was the strong man overpowering the demonic forces, you know, wrecking their palace, if you will, and taking ownership. So uh, let me just explain what that means to you. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, 
then God the Holy Spirit lives in you, okay? He, he owns you and no evil spirit can overpower Jesus to possess you. You are secure in Christ, okay? That, that's a reality for everyone who's a follower of Jesus. Holy Spirit's in you. And, and the Apostle John said, little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. Okay, Jesus has power over the evil spirits. Now, in the midst of this miracle that is taking place, in the midst of Jesus performing the impossible, his opponents level a false accusation. They were trying to take Jesus down a couple of notches in the eyes of the people. And so they said, um, the only reason Jesus can cast out demons is because he's got a demon that's bigger in him. Okay, that, that's what it's saying. Jesus is casting out Satan by the power of Satan. And Jesus simply refutes the accusation with a powerful and eternal truth. What does he say? He says, every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste and a divided household falls. Now, you may not have realized that, that was a Jesus quote because Abraham Lincoln is well known for his house divided speech in 1858 before the Civil War started. But Abe was quoting Jesus, okay, because he, he knew good material when he saw it. And so we see the power of Jesus, and Jesus highlights the power of unity. The power of unity. Uh, this is a, a simple life-altering truth, and, and it's not in your notes. So if you're taking notes, write it down beside him. If you're not taking notes, uh, you might want to take this down uh, anyway. Division destroys and unity builds. Okay, division destroys and unity builds. That's true at every point in organizational life. It doesn't matter what the organization is. Uh, it's true for a nation. Okay? Uh, division destroys and unity builds. Now, I personally believe the United States of America is the greatest nation on the face of the earth. Uh, and, and the, the best thing about us is we're united in the rule of law that is laid out in our Constitution. Okay, that, that's a, a gift that was given to all of us that are residents of the United States of America. Uh, our freedom and rights are foundational to the nation. And our greatest tragedy and victory at the same time was the American Civil War. When in that war, we fought over the principle that all men actually are created equal. We, we settled that as a nation uh, and that we were going to be a people of liberty and justice for all. And, and in the years since then, you know, over 150, we've still been trying to do that. And failing a lot, but hopefully getting better. But I want you to understand a nation divided against itself is laid waste. It's one of the reasons it's so frustrating to watch the news right now. It's one of the reasons it's so frustrating because we see that, we, we experience that, we're, we're, we're watching it, and, and, uh, and unity seems impossible in this moment, doesn't it? It just seems like it, there's no way it can happen. There's anger, there's frustration, there's anxiety uh, over injustice, over, you know, protests, over riots, over looting. Uh, all this stuff is going on, and we just feel so angry and so powerless at the same time. But it's not just, you know, the events of the last couple of weeks. We've just, you know, are we still, I don't know if we, st are we still in the coronavirus thing? Or is that like gone now? Because I mean, you know, we've been in this coronavirus thing and there was, you know, no unity as a nation then either because we were disagreeing over, you know, how long to stay locked down. Should we be locked down? Should you wear a mask? Should you not wear a mask? Can you go out? What, you know, what about schools and churches and businesses? When can they open again? You know, and hey, we're in election year. So we disagree politically. Okay, I mean, we know that, uh, and the emotional intensity is just increasing. And, and here's the thing, we all have opinions. We, we all have opinions. We all have opinions about politics. We all have opinions about the economy. We all have uh, opinions about policies and justice and what it looks like. And, and, and opinions are great. I want every one of you to have an opinion. Uh, you know, uh, I read a, a great meme just before I came out here, I, honestly. And uh, it, it said, uh, I actually don't want to know your opinion. I, uh, I just want to hear your opinion, my opinion coming out of your mouth. <laughs> See, we, we all have opinions and, and we all value our opinions. I want you to have convictions. 
Hopefully those convictions are biblically based. And I want you to vote your convictions. And, and, and I want you to express your convictions. Thank God for the First Amendment. Okay, that, that's a great gift to us, given to us by our forefathers. Okay, that's, that's wonderful. But here's the catch. I want you to represent Jesus while you do this. Actually, Jesus wants you to represent him while you do this. If you're a follower of Christ, that's not really optional. And Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus said, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you. Jesus, or, you know, Jesus challenged us that people would know us by our love. And, and the Apostle Paul put it this way, love is patient, love is kind. And guess what else? Love does not demand its own way. So for our nation right now that's crazy, let's be the people who stand for truth, who express our convictions passionately and lovingly. Passionately and lovingly even on social media, maybe especially on social media. So easy when you're not looking somebody in the eye that disagrees with you and to just to attack them and to, you know, eviscerate them and, and make fun of them. And can I just tell you, that's not Jesus. And if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then you want to represent him because our allegiance to Jesus trumps everything else. So division destroys, unity builds in the nation and in the church. In the church. Jesus prayed for our unity. He said that our unity would be evidence of him in our lives. He said, by this all men will know that you're my disciples if you love one another. He didn't say if you all agree on, on everything. He just said if you love one another. And so maybe churches in America have declined because we consistently fail at the point of unity. Because we're so busy attacking each other for not being exactly theologically correct or methodologically kosher that, that, we, that the world watches us and says, I don't want to be a part of that. I mean, have any of you been a part of a church fight besides me? People are like, I'm not raising my hand in church. Somebody's going to get mad. I can do it when the band's playing, but not when the preacher's talking. See, at... At Calvary, we're just really clear about what we're going to fight for, okay? There, there's really only two things. We're going to fight. We got five essential doctrines. You can read them on our website. Every Bible-believing Christian is going to agree with us, every single one. And then our mission, to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. That's it. That's what we're going to fight for um, because we're not interested in uniformity. You don't have to dress the same. You don't have to believe everything down the line the same. We're not interested in uniformity. What we want is unity in love and in mission. That's what we want because that's what we think Jesus wants, unity in love and in mission. And love means that we're striving constantly to represent Jesus in all our relationships, and that means how we treat people. It's easiest to see in how you treat people that you don't agree with or that don't agree with you. And our mission means our enduring priority above everything else is leading people to that life-changing relationship with Jesus because without Jesus, they have no hope. They have no eternal life. And look, doctrines are important. I went to higher education for 10 years studying the Bible, studying ministry, studying theology. Look, I value that. I want you to study. I want you to learn. I want you to develop biblical convictions you know, I want you to know your scriptures. But here's this, hear this. Your personal convictions are always subservient to love and mission. Your personal convictions don't trump Jesus' command to love your neighbor as yourself. Your personal convictions are not more important than leading people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And that is Calvary's commitment and Calvary's focus. And if you truly believe that your personal convictions take priority over the mission of Jesus, you are not going to be comfortable here. Okay, because we're relentless at this. Because when we are united as a church and loving people relentlessly and being committed to leading people to Jesus, we see God's power in our midst. That's the power of unity. Because division destroys and unity builds. And Jesus said, a divided household falls. 
It's true for the church. It's also true for your family. Your family. See, God desires your family to be healthy. He desires your family to be strong and joyful. And God hates divorce because it is destruction of a family and the damage is often generational. Doesn't mean God can't redeem it, but the damage is real. You see, God's plan is for a husband and a wife to fight together for the marriage, for the family. You see, God wants the couple to be a team that is sharing goals and sharing dreams and sharing values. That, that's what marriage is supposed to look like. And the best thing that you can do for your family is prioritize your marriage relationship. Okay, the best thing you can do for your family is to prioritize your marriage relationship. And, and I know what the temptation is, and I know it's a temptation of destruction because I hear people say it all the time. Oh, we put the kids first. That sounds noble, doesn't it? We put our children first. Our children are more important than us. Um, you both love the kids and you want to bless your children, but can I just tell you that is a terrible idea. That is a terrible idea. And some of you are going, no, pastor, we love our children. I want you to love your children. But here's the thing. Your marriage relationship must be the top priority over any other relationships in your family. That includes parents, siblings, and children. Because without a healthy marriage, you will end up with a broken family. Let me say that again. Without a healthy marriage, your family is going to be broken. See, there is a power in unity for a couple, and it blesses for generations when you live it out. And if you're sitting here or watching right now and you're going, um, that's not where we are and we need some help, we've got help available. You, you can make an appointment with one of your pastors. We would love to talk with you and pray with you and encourage you. We've got counseling available through the church and through relationships with counselors in our community. We would love to connect you. We've got marriage mentoring available. We have couples that are good at this thing called marriage, and they'd be glad to encourage you and mentor you. You can actually sign up for it on our website, find the marriage ministry tab, and check it out. We've got Celebrate Recovery every Monday night. We've got uh, Right Now Media that has all kinds of resources you can learn about relationships. In other words, help is available. Just ask for it. Because God wants you to have unity in your family. So division destroys, unity builds, and a house divided cannot stand. It's true with nations, it's true with churches, it's true with families. And Jesus has power. He has power over evil spirits, and he has power to change us. So where does that leave us? It leaves us with the choice. The choice. Did, did you catch what Jesus said in verse 23 as he ended this segment? Whoever is not with me is against me. Whoever does not gather with me scatters. We're left with a choice. Right now, our nation is pulling apart. We see it socially, we see it in the riots, we see it in the politics, it's pulling apart. And here's the thing, there are people who want you on their side. There are people who are trying to recruit you in their, to their ideology, they're trying to recruit you to their cause, and, and you know, there, there's people who want you to, you know, be a part of Black Lives Matters and, and protests. There's people who want you to stand up and support law enforcement. There are people who say, no, I want you to be in our, you know, politics, uh, our party, we want you to do that. And, and here's the reality. You've got convictions. And some of you are already a part of a lot of these different organizations, and, and I'm not going to denounce that at all. I'm not going to say that's not good at all. But here's the reality. Are you willing to choose character over your convictions? Are you willing to choose character over your convictions? Because here's what I see happening in our country. We have convictions, and a lot of us who are supposed to be Jesus people are letting our convictions trump our character. And we cannot represent Jesus unless we reflect his character, and his character is love your neighbor as yourself. His character is always for justice. His character is always for mercy. His character is always for redemption. 
So uh, honestly, uh, I've got all kinds of convictions politically. I've got all kinds of convictions about uh, how to promote justice. I've got all kinds of convictions about all the stuff going on, probably just like you do. But you're not going to hear me talking about them because um, the side I'm going to stand with is Jesus. It, it, it's Jesus, because whoever's not with me is against me, right? I, I, look, I, I'm going to be with Jesus, which means that all of my convictions are going to be subjugated to Jesus' character. And so whether I want to say something or not, I have to be patient and kind, because that's loving. Even if I don't agree, I have to be respectful, because that's loving. See, this is the hard part. This is the choice part. And I want to encourage you to choose to stand with Jesus. Because that's the choice. And by the way, you can't be for Jesus unless you're also for your neighbor. No matter what they believe or what they look like. You see, Jesus has the power to save, to deliver, to heal, to restore. He has the power to forgive and to change anyone's life. So today, are you with Jesus or are you against him? Because it matters for all eternity. Now, if you're sitting here or watching this and you're not yet a follower of Jesus Christ and you go, hey, you know what? I think I want to become a follower. That's what we want to. That's our mission. If you're watching online, then there's a button that you can click on and say, yes, I want to talk to someone about following Jesus or I want to follow Jesus. If you're here our prayer team is going to be available after the service right here at the front. Please come up and talk with them, pray with them. Come find one of the pastors at the Connection Centers or fill out a connection card, drop it in there. We will call you this week. We'll get together. We want you to make that commitment to follow Jesus. Or if you've already made that commitment, but nobody knows it, we got this lake baptism that's coming up in a couple of weeks, actually three weeks uh, from tomorrow. And uh, we would love to help you tell the world that Jesus has changed your life. But you have to decide because you have to make the choice. And my prayer for you is that you would choose Jesus. Will you pray with me? Father, our world is broken. And there's a lot of people that we know that are hurting and grieving and are broken. And you are the only one who can change this world. You're the only one who can change this uh, country. You're the only one who can change hearts and lives of people. Because as one brilliant man recently said, it is not a skin issue, it's a sin issue. And every one of us needs you. So Father, right now in our own lives, personally, we ask that you would bring healing, bring conviction, and change us so that we can live as the people of God, representing Jesus Christ with every single relationship that we're engaged in. So that you can use Calvary, you can use the people of God to lead life change throughout these communities that we're in and to the ends of the earth. We are helpless without you. We are hopeless without you. But because of Jesus, we have the promise of life eternal. So fill us with your presence and send us out into this world to make a difference. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.